Welcome to SOS VHS. Today's guest is Bobby Lee, and we will be talking about Pulp Fiction. Okay, go ahead. Okay. It's 1994. You're 23. Do you remember what, where you shot, uh, where you saw it? And, and I saw it in the movie theater. Okay, so that's the, the year that you started comedy too. And you, right? Uh, is that La Jolla your first like comedy uh, attempt? Uh, your first attempt to do in stand-up when you start working in at the comedy store there? Man. What? You're trying, huh? I love it. <laughs> I love to see I love to see I love to see you try to be fresh professional. <laughs> yeah. And and trying to get these questions that you pre route, right? Yeah. You have an agenda I can feel. I have an agenda. Yeah, and I love it. Okay. And I feel like you're a little scared right now. Oh, is that around you? Why? Let's, can we talk about that real quick? <laughs> sure. Let's talk about that real quick. Why? Well, I think like you're wild and you like to make people uncomfortable and you're really good at it. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm wild? Yeah. What do you mean wild? Wild. Like wild and out wild? Like MTV wild and out? Yeah. I, awkward. Um, no, you don't think... It, you remember how we met? What, what is it? <laughs> well, you remember the first time you saw me at your house, what you did. Did I flap my dick at you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so that. But that's a Korean thing. Oh, yeah. I see. Yeah. I to You're the first you Korean I know. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Okay. Are you Because uh, we've been working together for years now. Right. So why, why would you still be nervous? Because uh, I don't know what you're going to do. You know? I'm not doing anything. I showed up for you. Right. No, and I appreciate it. Okay. Do your questions. Okay. So, first time you're doing comedy, <laughs> La Jolla. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, how was your life back then? It was poor, aimless. Um, I was desperate, and um, it was a really big transition in my life. Because when you when you go throughout life, especially after you graduate from high school and you don't know what you want to do and the future feels hopeless. Um, it's just a scary feeling, man, because you're like, you know, you see the world and you see, you know, my parents were able to afford a house. They were able to buy cars and, t and raise a family. And it's like, I'm like, I have no skill set whatsoever to do any of that. Like I'm fucked. And you didn't want to go to college? I just didn't get good grades. I just like, you know, um, daydream too much. I'm a daydreamer, dude. <laughs> what about your, your family's like business since they had, they... Yeah, but I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to own a clothing store for women. You know what I mean? I mean, I saw how miserable my dad was and um, yeah, it's, it has nothing to do with my dream, you know? I think, I guess in the back of my head, I'm like, this could be a fallback thing, but there's just no way... I was going to do that because I have no passion about for it. And, you know, I thought maybe, you know, I would fall into something. But um, when I found comedy, I had hope. You know, it changed the direction of my life. And how did you decide to do comedy? Do you know who Gary Austin is? Mm -mm. So Gary Austin um, started The Groundlings mm. in 1971, 1972. And he was out of the groundlings and he did his own private classes. And I was in an A meeting when I was like maybe 19 years old. And I met this guy named Scott Collins. He was a bald headed kind of like uh, actor guy. And this is San Diego and really nice guy, talented guy. I liked him a lot. And Scott was just like, at a, a, he was at a meeting and he goes, um, you, I'm, you know, I, I created this thing called the actor studio in Pacific Beach. It was basically a, a loft space or whatever. And he goes, I invited Gary Austin to teach a improv class. And I go, I don't have a lot of money, but I'm, I mean, I could ask my parents. So my parents gave me some money and I took the class. And I remember going, oh, this is fun, you know? And it was just like eight of us in the class from every, every walk of life. Mm -hmm. But I just remember going, um, and I also remember Gary going, wow, you're funny. Like well, every, every, every improv would turn into a suicide. 
mm-hmm. with my character take killing themselves, right? But it's like, you know, I just remember laughing a lot. And then Gary invited me to LA. This is a true story. He invited me to LA and, he, and I took his class in Burbank. And I remember I had this truck and I had a, a window missing. And I drove all the way up here. And, I, was, and I, I remember the song I was listening to over and over again. It was Frank Black's Los Angeles, that song. Um, it was his first, first solo album. I love the Pixies. And um, am I talking too much? Mm-mm. And I remember taking his class. And then afterwards, at, I was going to drive back. And he goes, I know you're poor. But he goes, um, let me buy you dinner with another guy from the class. I go, where are we going to go? He goes, Jerry's Deli. And at this time, you know, I kind of knew, he knew me and stuff, right? And I was like 19, 20 years old. And he, we were at Jerry's Deli. It was like one in the morning. And we were talking and he goes, um, asking me about my interests and stuff. And I go, I play a little piano. And he goes, well, how, how do I n- not know that about you? I go, well, I don't know. I'm shy. He goes, well, if you're shy, you're never going to make it in comedy or in, in the business. And I go, all right. And he goes, I'll tell you this. I promise, I'll make you a deal. He goes, in front of this restaurant, stand on the seat. You tell the whole restaurant that you play the piano. All right? And he goes, I promise you, in 10 years, you'll be on The Tonight Show. I swear to God he said that. And I stood up on my chair, screamed as loud as I could. I play the piano. The whole fucking place <laughs> gave me an applause break. I sat back down. The adrenaline's running, right? What's so funny? <laughs> Nothing. And um, that was the first time I was kind of like, oh, I have to like be willing to do that, right? It's like I always had this social anxiety or whatever. I couldn't lock pe- my eyes with people. I couldn't talk to people. And I go, these are things that I have to correct you know and just be bold and just to be willing to do things and that was kind of the first seed that was kind of planted gary austin did that okay and you went <laughs> the other way around no to be completely brutally honest and kalila said to me uh that you gave her this advice early on which is uh don't let anyone have anything over you so don't show any weakness and just like you your words put your words uh stuff out there so nobody can talk about that or you know feel shit. I, I i mean I, I, maybe i've said that but i don't know if that's the healthiest advice <laughs> right. you know what i mean um i think at one point maybe i believe that um because it, it's been used against me you know in in different ways but um yeah i don't really have um anything i'm embarrassed about or or whatever you know i um because you know when you're when you're a kid and you're not getting laid and you have no money, what? that's the worst. You have no future. That's the worst place you could be. Well, it can't get worse than that, right? So you might as well you know, make a fool of yourself, you know? And um, so maybe that's partly right. I don't know. I have to think about it. Okay. What, uh, we're not going to go back to the movie or? Yeah, we're going to go okay. back to the movie. I just want to know, you, you haven't talked much about your La Jolla years, like everything I've been looking about you. I mean, you have talked a lot. You've been to a lot of shows and talked to a lot of people about like that time when you were younger. Uh, so I just want to, I'm curious to know what, what was the thing that, um, I don't know, that made Polly Shore like say, hey, let's, you know, go on the road with me. Well, I, 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 I remember watching, I bought tickets for his show at UCSD because I was living in La Jolla and me and my friend Alan Meadows went and we had back row. And this is when P- Polly was on fire. And I remember going, um, wow, he's just a weird guy, huh? It's just the way he would tell his jokes and his presence on stage was like, I had never seen anything like it. You know, it was almost as if, he didn't care. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I remember walking away with that I, the idea like, oh, that guy's weird, you know? And I remember, um, so I, I worked at a rest, uh, at a coffee shop called Disc Cafe. It was owned by 91X, which was a, a radio station still in San Diego. And um, Mike Halloran, you know what I mean? The music coordinator guy and his cousin owned Disc Cafe. And I remember walk, because I, I had to walk by the comedy store for years to go to Disc Cafe. And I remember a couple of times I would see Paulie in the lobby and I would get nervous. And then when Disc Cafe closed, I needed a job. So I just got a job next door, really. 
But um, at that time, I had a job at a restaurant as a waiter, and I worked at the Panikin too as a barista. And uh, then I got a job at nights at the store. You know, um, it was. Uh, you know, if I look back, it was hard. But if I look back those feelings of it's a feeling of like being in a dreamlike state of like wow this is magical i remember one time we were uh, i was working at the store and dom irera was in town and he um wasn't performing but he walked and i knew who he was and i remember him sitting it was like two in the morning and it was a saturday night and he sat around and the whole staff surrounded him and he just told war stories about show business and it's because you know when you're from Poway and you, you know you don't know anybody from show business it just seemed to me like wow this is cool you know what I mean because here's a guy I used to watch on TV and stuff you know what I mean and now I'm like five feet away from him and he's telling these fucking stories and I remember back then I met a young Joe Rogan a young Carlos Mencia, a young, a lot of these young people that are now big things. But I remember all those guys um, that would pop in. And I met all those guys back then when I was working at the store. Obviously, I was a doorman and didn't get any respect. You know, no one even knew that I did stand up really. But I remember, you know, watching Paul Mooney and all these people. And I just thought it was like, wow, this is like a dream come true almost. Even just being at that level, being at the comedy store in La Jolla back then was just like um amazing do you remember any dumb jokes from your beginning like yeah. the one that mia has in pulp fiction <laughs> yeah i mean um one of my jokes was like ah oh, um i'm so lonely you know you're lonely is when you masturbate and you grab your own ass <laughs> So I go, yeah, and I do me, do me, I would, and I would turn around and sh squeeze my own ass. Mm -hmm. Jokes like that. Okay. I had another dumb joke where it's like, um, my mom was a Jehovah's Witness, and um, which she was. My mom was a Jehovah's Witness, and she would knock on my bedroom door, knock, 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 and I go, Mom, what do you want? She goes, just practicing. <laughs> <laughs> like, like simple jokes like that, okay. you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, was my first initial way of doing it you know okay yeah um and then uh you you said many times that your childhood with your your dad and your difficult situation uh led to you know alcohol and drugs and all of that stuff mm -hmm. but do you do you have like like you know butch in, in the movie bruce willis's character has this watch from his dad this precious thing that he's willing to risk his life for uh do you have anything like that from from your dad no From your family? No. Um, my father wasn't sentimental in that way. Mm -hmm. um, he also didn't have a firm grasp of the English language. And um, so everything was like one word. No. Okay. Okay is a word. No. Uh, if you do, you're going to die. <laughs> like very simple, direct things. And I, I always wanted like a sit down with him and go, you know, Like, you know, your, your, when you would go out with your friends in high school, their parents would sit them down and go, hey, you know, so if you're ever in trouble, give me a call or, you know, don't do this, don't do drugs, you know, whatever, whatever. And these kind of talks and stuff, my dad would just not be like, hey, don't do dumb, okay? <laughs> and right. then they'd say, like, oh, I won't do anything dumb, you know? But, like, I got nothing from him in terms of, um, you have to work hard. I think that's the only thing he said. <laughs> And when when you tell him that you wanted to do comedy or how did that conversation go? Did you? He doesn't even know what it is. It's like saying, um, "Hey, Dad, I want to be a tonkatsu mind melder." <laughs> Literally, if that's what I say, <laughs> I want to be a tonkatsu mind melder. Right. What? Yeah, it's a thing. You know what I mean? That that's what comedy was to him. Okay. Yeah, a sunshine, a sunshine sea dweller. <laughs> Imagine if I said that, your son, or, you have a son, right? A daughter. A daughter. She goes, Dad, I want to be a sunshine sea dweller. Right. What would you say? Uh, what? Uh, yeah. A hopscotch um, <laughs> kneecap. I want to be a hopscotch kneecap. <laughs> Got it. Right? Right? That kind of thing. So, but did you make your dad, your dad laugh or not? No. Would you, never? The only time he laughed, he, ma he caught me masturbating once and he laughed. <laughs> yeah, but. Yeah, that's the only time I made him laugh. Um. 
so was he ever like proud of you in that process when you he saw you on TV and yeah, well? then yeah, then right. I mean, to them, I mean, it's like because it happened. I mean, if I look back relatively fast, I mean, I started in '95, and then by 2000, I was on Leno, Jay Leno, and I did Mad TV. That's five years. That yeah, was fast. It's pretty fast, you know. Um, and so when I did the Tonight Show, my parents saw that, and they couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, what immigrant family that doesn't know anything about show business? I mean, when you turn on the TV, you know, they probably think, oh, that's just a life for somebody else. Where I, I was dumb enough to go, I can do that, which is like, you know, so dumb. Especially, about, you know, these Asian people, not kids now. It's just like, you know, I mean, <laughs> things they complain about. It's like, you know, it, it, I'm like, bro, start. If you would have started the way I was, you would have quit. It was fucking hard, man. Mm -hmm. they'd get nothing there was nothing for me zero you know I couldn't get anything you, you know and it was so it's like I don't know I don't know how any of it happened yeah I, I rewatch a lot of your mad TV stuff and you, you said something about like being playing all with the stereotypical characters and things like that but they were really funny some of them were yeah <laughs> I think some of them were yeah you know, I look back at them too I go oh that was pretty good or that was good um you know, I, I look back at Mad TV in fondness. Um, it was a terrible, I had some terrible times on that show. Um, I learned how to act. I was terrible at table reads. I didn't know how to do any of it. I couldn't act. I, I had to learn on, like, I had to fail on TV. Like, I would have to, people, would, directors would have to go, you can't look in the camera. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. That's a mark. Like, no one taught me what a mark is. Right. Right? Like, the jib cameras, you know, jib, what the fuck is that? You know, you don't know any of this shit. So, when you're there, you're just constantly, like, failing and asking questions and going, I'm sorry. You know, and, you know, a lot of people don't think you're good. You know, a lot of people didn't think I was good. That we're, like, a part of the show. Right. You know, I, I, you know, I think the owner of the show, Salzman, really liked me. He saw something like this guy's nuts. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. you know, I mean, the things that you see, I was way worse back then. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was fucking crazy, dude. Right. You know what I mean? Like I believe nuts. It. I you believe know? It. So um yeah, I'm pretty tame. Well, times change too. What do you mean? I'm saying like what was acceptable maybe twenty years ago. Yeah. I mean, yeah, things change. You know what I mean? You, I mean, obviously, I know what is right and what's wrong now, you know what I mean? But before, it was like, no, it's like anything's, anything goes. It's fair game. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I remember one time, <laughs> I don't know if I could share this, but I remember one time, and th so poor Josh Myers and Ike Bernholtz. So me and Josh and Ike, we had to do an interview for something, right? And we were in the green room, and I and they had these like little, like, marbles on the table of this like green room and i started sticking marbles in my butthole and jamming things in my butt in front of them and it made them really nervous <laughs> like what are you doing i go come right. on man you know it's not relaxing <laughs> you know what i mean this is how i relax you know what i mean but i would never do that now <laughs> right right and then they would have to go like y you can't do that in front of me anymore you know what i mean i go okay one time i i stuck tums in my butthole in front of Ike, and I, sh I, I shot out foamy Tums tablets and poo. <laughs> he thought that was funny. But, I mean, I would just do crazy things. Right. Fart in people's mouths. You know, you know, you know the stories. Yes. I, I've, I've heard a lot of those stories. Yeah. Uh, and did you have any sort of, like, partner back then? Any jewels to, to Vincent Vega? Any, or was, were you always, like, more like a lone writer? What do you say? Like, do you do you? I have know who Vince Vega is, but what? No, like you know that he has a partner in the movie, and he they do things together all the time. And you have someone to like, you know, let, rely on. Do you have someone like that? I have one now. Is is Andrew your yeah. your, your Jules? Yeah, I have one now. Okay, you know those those kind of relationships, um, you can't force, and they take time. You know, Andrew, um, over the years. And if I really think about it, um, has really been a ride or die for me. Um, he's, he, he'll never leave and I'll never leave him unless we get to a point where like, you know, let's do different things. And, you know, we had our run 
Yeah. I, I could see that happening, but um, no, we're both really loyal to each other, and um, yeah, I mean, it's I have it now. Um, before I, I, you know, I didn't have it before because I didn't know I. <sighs> I didn't know who I was, you know? What do you mean? In terms of comedy? In general. I didn't have a voice comedy-wise. I was just all over the place. In just in terms of the way I lived my life, no responsibility, do whatever I want to do, right? Um, and not taking responsibility for anything. And and now, and also just also simultaneously hating myself. Fucking looking in the mirror and going, go fuck yourself. I hate you, you know. Um, and I, I don't feel that way about myself now. And I think that once you start kind of loving yourself, like I, I um, Abby today, I, she goes, I need a photo of you in your early twenties for this movie that I did, and they want they're gonna put it in like the end of the movie. And I and I and I looked at the photo that I sent, and I almost cried because it's like I had such empathy for that guy you know you just kind of look back and go god that kid was such a sweet kid you know in my face you can tell just a sweet guy just completely lost and scared and fucking confused you know mm -hmm. it was hard so yeah i have one now i have a vincent vega is that what you're saying no. <laughs> a jewel is that what you're gonna do right now you're gonna you're gonna you're asking i wanna link the movie to your to my life and <laughs> yeah. that's what you've been doing yeah Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Hi, SOS VHS fans. As you know, on top of being a producer, one of my biggest passions is teaching and helping the next generation of podcast producers and content creators achieve their dreams. So if you want to be like us, go to 7 com or click the link below and sign up for a one-week bootcamp course in August. I'll see you there. Okay, but okay, let me change subjects for a second. Like Tar Tarantino uh, got a lot of shit like after Pulp Fiction and other movies he did for using racial slurs and like, you know, the type of thing that we're talking about that times have changed. Uh, do you think there is there should be or there are, there are limits to comedy? No. There should be free and... Yes. Okay. So I, I mean, but I'm not the right one to ask, I don't think. You know, I... Um, as a kid, I, w I always gravitated toward Kinnison and Dice and these types of acts that were like almost volatile in, in a weird way, you know? Um, I know it just, I responded to it, the anger, like when Dice would, when Sam Kinnison would scream, and I was in high school, whatever, and I would just completely relate to that, you know? I remember... Um, Dana Gould had a special a long, long time ago on Showtime. Mm -hmm. I think he was talking about suicide or something. I just related. I remember think, thinking about that joke. So I was related to um, people that were like on the edge, you know. Um, and, I, and, and I've said this before and I've gotten a lot of flack for it. Like I honestly, and I'm, he's a legend and I, he's great, but I, I just, I've never really laughed at Jerry Seinfeld. Like yeah. I remember what I, I I just I, I tilt my head and I watch and I just don't know what I'm supposed to laugh at, and I know that people are laughing and right. I know that he's great. But is it too clean? Like I don't know what it is. I, I don't know what it is. I just I can't get. I don't get it. Like Dennis Miller was another one too. It was like I understand that's witty, you know what I mean? But it just doesn't hit my funny bone really you right know? um would you like darker stuff too i don't even know if that's the case i mean right. i i mean i'll i'll i like disney movies mm -hmm. i mean i like um like the incredibles i think that's a great movie yeah i saw both of them there's two right <laughs> there's two. yeah yeah you know i've watched all the toy stories and you know i mean i giggle at though i mean i like it but that's not what you would do as your comedy that's not your your brand no. <laughs> right. No. I wouldn't even know how to write like that, you know? Um, yeah, but on one hand, I feel like you draw from your real life, but also you are like master of fake news. Everything that you say, like you make up so many stories, you lie a lot, you exaggerate, right? Like that's kind of like, you like to shock people. I feel like that's more like your... 
your brand. <laughs> yeah. But I've always been like that. Right. Yeah, you know I mean, I've always like said crazy things that aren't true, but I um I don't know if that's healthy. I don't think it's healthy. I mean, Joe Rogan said something about like uh you know, for comics to really be funny, they have to go to those uncomfortable places and swing and sometimes you miss. And Yeah, he's been, he's actually been um believe it or not, he's been really like helpful toward me. I remember I was going through something a couple of years ago and we talked for a couple hours on the phone and um Yeah, I think that he's one of those guys that um one of those you know, the wise sage, you know. Mm -hmm. Like he's one of them for me. Um I think Mark Maron is one of them for me. Um these are guys that I can go to if it's a serious problem and go, what do I do? You know what I mean? And they've helped me, you know. Um But uh yeah, I mean but it but I just have always been like um I think because it's like my dad was so violent, you know what I mean? That I lived in a fantasy world or something in my head to escape. You know, yeah. I I still have the same kind of like daydreams as I did as a kid. You know, like revenge fantasies and this and that, right? Like right. the same kind of coping mecha me mechanisms to get me through certain things, you know? Right. Um, but, like, I'm so aware of it now, you know? Like, you know, as a kid, you don't know why you do certain things to cope. Right. Right? But I would act out and say crazy things so I get attention and, you know what I mean? Anything to feel what I'm really feeling and dealing with, you know, my home environment, you know? Um, I wouldn't change anything for the world, but, you know? Yeah. So is it cathartic? Cathartic. Cathartic to use the... To, to see violence, to play video games that are violent, to... I mean, I, I enjoy that stuff, too, and, and the fiction world, uh, I don't know. And then in the real world, I'm very different. But... Uh, no, I mean, I don't... It's not, I don't just grab... I mean, like, if you look at the movie, you can count on me, mm -hmm. right? And it's... I mean, there's love loss and, and family heartbreak in that, right? And Mark Ruffalo's um, character in the movie is just going through his whole life. He's just the trauma of what happened. Mm -hmm. Like, I completely relate to that character, Yeah, right? Um, there was a lot of trauma as a kid. You know what I mean? Watching my dad beat up my mom, you know, is traumatic. And how do you look at that and deal with it? I did it through fantasy. I did it through acting out. I did it through, you know, farting on people and, And making a fool of myself, you know. Yeah. But um, anyway, go back to Pulp Fiction. So. Okay, well, last question before. Uh, what? So, what do you think of like you know of a joke that you could tell at any point, like in 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 people knowing how you how you are, and then come people getting offended like years later or coming back to bite you? How how do you look at the world like like that and say, hey, I came up with, I came up. Like this, this was my brand. I like. Uh, I grew up in a world where I could say whatever I want, and now like people get offended or get like, or just I don't know. It's a different world, and things that you could you say as a kid can come back and bite you in the in the ass. I can't change the past. I mean, that's it. Okay. There's nothing I can do to dwell on anything I've done. Mm -hmm. So it's just like I just move forward. I mean, I um, I don't know. I mean. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> why did that? Why did his just mouth just open? He is my producer. Oh, do we let <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Talk about something. So when I everything that I I read about you and that I I I listen to many podcasts, you always tell a kind of an origin story of you. Yeah. That, but that story of like you being molested and all that, I, I see so many different variations of that story. Yeah, none of, none of it's true. Right. Yeah. So why? Why do you think that that Who was- Who cares? No, I'm saying like- why Who do, cares? Why did you think like that is your, your way to say, hey, this is my origin story? Because I had to, as a kid, I had to lie about certain things. Like, you know what I mean? I can't say like, oh, my dad gets drunk and beat up my mom, right? Okay. Oh, my dad's an orthopedic surgeon. Right? And he's into fucking yoga. <laughs> okay. Right? You know, my mom it was a, a Korean's version of NASA. Right? Okay. You know, I just, I would just lie because mm -hmm. I just didn't like 
my home life, you know? Um, but this is a lie that shocks people. Every time you tell us, you can see how people are very uncomfortable. You say it in different podcasts and everybody gets a reaction of like, first shock, then laughter, and then you keep going. And I think like, I don't know if people always, I see a lot of comments where like people say like, we don't know when Bobby is, is this a bit or not? Yeah, never exactly. Know. And You're that's right how now. I want to keep it. Mm -hmm. Because there are truth, truisms and things that I say. Mm -hmm. Some of it's not. Yeah, I mean, um, when I'm like even here now talking to you, yeah, you know, you kind of just pick and choose of, you know, what do I say right now? You know, what I mean, if I because I if I tell you the blatant truth, yeah, is that entertaining for people to listen to? But if I'm like poking and like you know, what I mean, doing yeah. some deception, right, and some mind play, you know, what I mean, and some shadow shadow play, you know, um, th it's more interesting. You okay, know? so y are you always on? No. Okay. Oh, I what? mean, you've seen me bummed out, right? You've seen me like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know what I mean? Whatever, right? So it's like, like you saw me during when I was relapsed the last time. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It was not pretty, you know? Yeah, but it's still you have the energy to like put a show like when there's people looking. Yeah, because, you know, there's only like, I think it took years for me to have Andrew. Like Andrew has been checking up on me because he's out of town, see how I'm doing, right? And I mm -hmm. really feel like sharing with him everything that I'm going through um, because I trust him. Mm -hmm. um, and then a lot of people that are in show business or whatever in comedy, um, you don't know that well. So you give them like sort of headline stuff or, you know, bullet points, right? You don't really dive deep. Okay. Um, how are you? I'm all right. You know, instead of going, well, no, this, you know, my dad, oh, my mom, you know what I mean? Right. You know, so it's like you pick and choose who, you know, you know, but it takes a long time for me to do trust, you know. I trust you. I really do. I call you with problems. I call you with issues. Sometimes um, I'm a little too maybe honest or I'm not honest. Um, I'm too um, harsh in my language or my tone, but I do trust you. I trust, trust George and the people that I work with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is George your wolf? I think he is. <laughs> right. That's interesting. Yeah, I think George is my wolf. Right. I think George um, is a guy I call at the wee hours. Have I called you wee hours at the night? Yeah, but I don't answer as much now that I have I know kids. you have a kid. He doesn't answer as much. Right. You don't answer as much either because you have a new baby. I, I, I fucking... Yeah. Yeah. I don't like it. Did you wake her up last night? <laughs> no, I don't remember her crying. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry. But yeah, I think George is my wolf. Um, <laughs> so who's, who's Gilbert then? Gimp. <laughs> Gilbert's the gimp. So w would you come back and rescue him from the, yeah, from sad? Yeah. Yeah, he's a no, he's not the gimp. Um, <laughs> who would Gilbert be in real life in um, in that show? I think. Well, who am I in it? I That's think, the main question. I think you're Vincent. Oh, I'm Vincent Vega. So I die. Yeah. Oh, I die at the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So what is Kalila Uma Thurman? Yes. Yes, for sure. So who's Ving Rhames? If I'm if I'm. Um, you think that's Andrew? <laughs> I think Andrew might be Bruce Willis. Yeah, Andrew's Bruce Willis. <laughs> but who's the guy that I work for? Yeah. Maybe Matt Blake, my agent or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, oh. that, that movie is cool because there's just certain themes in it that like you, you hadn't really seen, you know. Um, the whole, that whole gimp scene, for instance, right? I know, I, you know, when I was a kid, one of my favorite bands of all time was um, the Velvet Underground. I remember a freshman year, I went and bought the Velvet Underground, Velvet Underground and Nico album. And I, had re I hadn't really done heroin, you know what I mean? Or, and I didn't know much about S&M. But I remember those were like themes in the music. And I just remember going, this is just cool because, you know, me, you know, I've always gravitated toward... Andy Warhol and the factory and the and the kind of characters that hung out there, like Edie Sedgwick. And I knew that like, you know, Mick Jagger and Dylan, people would go, you know what I mean? It was, and there was always things being created and, tr you know, 
people are making things, you know what I mean? Like short films and people taking, you know, photographs and creating a band right. and all these things. And it mm -hmm. was it's something that I was like, I, I wish I was in New York in the early 70s. That would be fucking dope. Mm -hmm. I probably would have died from like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Heroin overdose <laughs> or whatever. But well, Have you ever taken the wrong drug? No. <laughs> no. Okay. For all the right drugs. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying like, like Mia does. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Your beautiful lips. Thank you. Do you. Do people say that? I don't think so, but... Your lips are so nice. Thank you. Uh -huh. Great compliment. Um, so, I think like you you are a true artist, you know? Someone who, who also has a lot of like, you know, you love the arts, you know a lot about movies, a lot about film, uh, music and art, but usually you play dumb a lot. I like am dumb. The show. No, you, you. I mean, I feel like it's a, it's an act. You, you. No, no. You can. What are you talking about? I'm saying, like that. You have a vast knowledge of on all, all of, of some this. things. I do. Right. Things I'm interested in. Yeah. But the things that I'm not interested in, there's no opinion or no knowledge. Like, ask me something that's outside of the things we talked about. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't know. You are in no, no, no. politics. I want you to Where fucking is. ask a question that you haven't written down. Okay. Ask me a question. Name the first five Beatles albums. <laughs> I don't know if in order, but I can tell you all the Beatles albums. Is that? Yeah. Right. But no, no, no. That's not what I was asking. Ask me something about, you know, who's, uh, like, what happened during the Civil War? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. You don't know what? I mean, I know there was a war between the North and the South. It had to do with slavery. <laughs> right lincoln was president yes the civil war yeah why'd you shake your head no i'm just exactly this is what i'm talking about you know a lot about something and then you play with it yeah but i don't know the intricate details about like you know I me mean, who rated what and what rated what you know okay. what i mean yeah like who the heroes of the battles were you know what i mean i don't know anything about that okay uh, i don't know much about um the royal family like e all everything i know about the royal family is from the crown Right? right, but I ended with Princess Diana and her death or whatever. So like, I don't know anything else after. Like, like people ask me shit about like, well, what do you think of Prince Henry and the things that are going? Like, I don't know anything about him. Okay, I know that Markle, right? That's his wife. She's black. Something's going on. We're like, you know what I mean? They don't like black people. I don't know what it, what it is. I don't know what it is. Okay, but like I I I I know vague like you know like during the Johnny Depp shit, right? There's something going on, man. They don't like each other. There's poo involved. <laughs> Right? Right. Right. There's drinking involved. Right. She seems like I don't know. They both seem They're crazy. Right. Yeah. They're both So yeah, so I you know, I, I know basics on certain things. Um, but I don't you know, like Pol Pot. I mention his name a lot. I don't know much about him. Kimir Rouge. Right? The right? The killing fields. He slaughtered his own people. I know that he he died as an old man because they let him live or whatever. Mm -hmm. But like, but I don't know anything else. Ask me something else. Okay. So Ask me something that like something about history or something. Let me see if I can come up with something. Okay. Who's the president of France? Macron. Macron, yeah. Did I say it right? Yeah, I'm not retarded. Don't. Yeah, there's a difference between not, you know what I mean. What I'm saying. Right. I know basics. Yeah. About what's going on in the world. You know what I mean. Okay. Yeah. What's going on in Eastern Europe? What is going on? No, I know. <laughs> I know you know. Um, okay. Yeah, but you're right. It is a, I think you're right. I think it is a, like not being able to pronounce words, for instance. Yeah. Right? I don't know how. <laughs> no, you do know. Some words I don't. <laughs> You'd like to play that. Yeah. But I, because I remember like, I remember years ago, I had this joke. I still do it sometimes. This notebook joke. It's about the movie, The Notebook. Mm-hmm. And I remember going, hey, have you guys seen the movie Notebook? <laughs> and I just said it like that. Notebook. And people laughed because I said it like that. So I thought to myself, I go, if you just say certain words <laughs> like that, right? It'll just get immediate laugh. Like you don't know what how to pronounce it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I love doing that. Like sometimes I'll go to like uh, Starbucks or whatever. And if like Michael Jackson is playing or whatever, like, you know what I mean? Like um, beat it or something. I'll go to the cashier and I go, who is this? <laughs> right. They go, you don't know? I go, no, I've never heard of it. What is it? They go, it's Michael Jackson beat it? I go, okay, I'll write it down. <laughs> Michael Jackson beat it, right? 
Yeah. It's a fun game. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think, well. What? No, nothing. Well, yeah, so you're just giving away all my secrets here. Is that what well, this fucking podcast is about? <laughs> what? about not... Let's bo- look at, at all of Bobby's co- comedic muscles and break them down. <laughs> okay. No, not, not, not my intention. I just wanted to hear something that I haven't heard in uh, a lot of the interviews that you have given before. But we can play a game soon after this. Okay, yes. Let's... Why, do you think it's going bad? No. no. I think it's going good. Going great. Um... Hey, Bobby. Stop. Okay, another thing that you like, uh, uh, music. What was your favorite track from Pulp Fiction? <sighs> that opening track. The surfer. I love that. I love that. I love, even if when I hear that, like, you know, um, when they bring me up on stage, sometimes they'll play that. <laughs> like, when I'm on the road. I don't ask for it. Yeah. I hate comics. I go, can you play this? You know, here's the thing that I do say, though. I go, they used to do when I went on the road. Like, if, if I wouldn't say, like, what to play, they would, everybody is a kung fu fighter. <laughs> like, something Asian. And I, I, I have to go up to them afterwards and go, don't fucking play that song. It's so stupid. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. It, what? <laughs> Nothing. I think it's. No, there was another point, but keep talking and then I'll. Oh, uh, now about the music in. The... Okay. In Pulp Fiction. Um, like that song. What else? Have you ever committed a, a crime that you were, you know, was the worst crime, I guess, you got caught at? By? We never committed a crime. Okay. I mean, I don't know what a crime is, like, <laughs> in terms of what, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I've never committed a crime, no. No. I shoplifted as when I was in high school. Right. I got caught once. But other than that, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, at the end of the day, I, I think I'm just like, I live like a Christian, dude. <laughs> Okay. Like I have a sex, I have sex missionary style. That's my preferred position. Um, yeah, I learned that. Right after I'm done making love, right, I go. Do you want a towel? Like I'm very polite, mm-hmm. you know. And um, but you don't like to cuddle. I do, to an extent. <laughs> okay, but I don't like um. For hours, it's weird. Like start going into my mind. You know what I mean? And then you have an itch. You're like. Should I itch you know what i mean like i don't like any of that okay um okay let's let me wrap up people. well here's another thing i know about people don't know oh this is what i wanted to mention okay i know a lot about arsenal fc <laughs> oh yeah you know what I mean like so, so like when i'm obsessed with something yeah i'll just know everything about it you know Wh- why soccer because i am saying why because in this country you have so many options right if you're from europe it's just soccer i'm so glad you asked um Honestly, yeah. I've tried to watch football, American football. Yeah. I just find it to be so boring. Basketball, it's like they're always back and forth scoring, right? And it all boils down to the last minute usually in basketball. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The score is pretty close, and whoever gets lucky enough, right, to get the last thing in. So I guess there's drama there, right? But it's just, it doesn't do anything for me. It never has. But soccer also is pretty tight, usually. What? In soccer, is also the, the score is pretty tight at zero. But there's drama. Okay. There's real drama in soccer. Let me ask you the last question. What, 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 what in your mind is in the uh, briefcase that Vincent and, and Jules retrieved for Marcelo's Wallace? Oh, in the briefcase? Yeah. You know, it's so funny. <laughs> I, I never cared to know. Mm-hmm. Because to me, it's like when that, when you see the light shining through the caves and reflecting on the face, it's whatever the viewer wants it to be. Right. And that's why I think it's genius. Um, you know, I've run into Quentin a couple of times in my life, and he always remembers me. I get so nervous when I'm around him. I just can't say anything. I don't know. It's like, thank you, thank you. You know what I mean? But it's like, but the same with, I was in a fucking, when I was doing that movie, The Dictator, did I tell you the story? No. So I was, you know, I was at the Soho Grand or whatever, and I was shooting, you know, and I I remember I had a day off, and I'm at the elevator going up to my room, and this light-skinned black guy walks into the elevator. It was Thierry Henry. You know who that is? Mm Mm-hmm. You know, he was Arsenal's you know, a legend. And I'm telling you right now, dude, 
It is a fact. He could have asked me to do anything in the elevator. I would have fucking done it. That's all I want to say. Yeah. I was tongue-tied. I was shaking. I was nervous. And I was like, you know what? I can't say anything. I'll tell you why. If I said something and he was in a bad mood or whatever, so I just, you know, I'm going to let the fantasy stay the fantasy. And I'm going to let this weird 12-second encounter with him be it. Right. It was, quite frankly, (laughs) one of the most magical 12 seconds of my life. Okay. Go ahead. Cool. So, uh, okay. Let's see how... It's like... Okay. I, no, I'm just saying. Why do I? Why do I have to go? Because you like to be in the Hollywood. Uh, yeah, but it's not. It's a screening. It's not a live show. They're, they filmed it. Right. So I'm gonna be in a theater with all these fucking people. Yeah. And they're like, "You gotta go." I go I'm not in it. Networking. You lo- network. I already fucking did it. You love it. No, I already connected <laughs> with those guys. You love being in Hollywood. Okay. You think I'm a Hollywood guy? You. Who's look- more Hollywood, me or Andrew? <laughs> we have this. No, let me ask you this: Who's more Hollywood, me or Andrew? You guys are both pretty Hollywood, but you are. You think I am more Hollywood than he is? Yeah. Why? I think you're a little above. Why? You're a little above. Why? But you, you are, you're older and you have done more things. Anyway. But wait a second. He, you. No. Gross. <laughs> There's no way. You, you don't love Hollywood. I don't do the Hollywood shit. He plays golf with fucking the fucking well, famous. Okay, right now, I, po- podcasting has given you kind of like this fame, right? That maybe... Or rebirth after Mad Mad TV, but you're still chasing the movies and the TV bro, stuff, bro. Before the podcast, I had done movies, been regular on sitcoms. What the fuck are you talking about, fool? <laughs> right? Okay. I did the Hollywood shit, right, fool? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean, but <laughs> you're doing more now, yeah, because of the podcast. It, exactly, right? That's yeah. what I'm saying. Like, but you still consider that above the podcast. No. Okay, so you... Tr- okay. If you were to ask me yeah. right now, you can either do television film f- for the rest of your life yeah. or podcast and stand-up for the rest of your life. Obviously, I'd pick fucking... I would pick podcasting and stand-up. Yeah. Because they're, they're reliable. Um, I don't know how long it's going to last. That's the thing, you know? But if it dies, it dies. And I'll just change. You know, I um, you know, I shared at a meeting the other day, and Amy and I was just like, I honestly, and this is the first time I'm ever going to say this, is that it might be okay to move on. Now, let me add, say this. You know, I don't know what I would do for a living. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's the only thing that bums me out about like trying something different. Yeah, is is that there's just not, I'm not going to make as much the same kind of money. Yeah, like you have I, no skills. Exactly. <laughs> but if they're like, you can be, you can review albums. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And you can make this small amount a year. You know what I mean? I don't know. Maybe. Or we want you to be an A&R man for stand-ups. Right? <laughs> yeah. No, I can do it. Yeah. You know, I think I can. I mean, you know what I did with in South Africa, baby? What? What? <laughs> what? In South Africa. What? What in South Africa? What I? Did. What did you do in South Africa? He discovered. I didn't Trevor disco- Noah. I didn't discover. Oh him, well, but yeah. I, I made a call on his behalf. Oh, I see. So that's what you want to do? Like you're gonna? I think I. I, I dude, bro, I'm telling you right now. I think I have an eye. Yeah. You have an eye too. I have two eyes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this fucking guy. <laughs> That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Okay. That really dumb. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, but you have a... No, no, no. Uh, you. Let me talk about you for <laughs> no, a second. No. Yeah, let me talk about you for a second, okay. right? You're confused, son. Okay. You're a confused European. Yeah. Right? Anyway. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so the next... I'm going to take the lip compliment back. <laughs> okay. okay. Next part. Let's see how, how well you know uh, Pulp Fiction. What does it say on Jules Winfield's wallet? Something motherfucker. Bad uh, motherfucker. I'll okay, take okay, it. Okay, that, did I get that one? Yes. Which actor from Reservoir Dogs makes a cameo in Pulp Fiction dressed as Billie Holiday? I know. Steve Buscemi. Yeah. Yes. From what book does Jules Winfield quote before he kills Brad? The Bible. <laughs> yeah. Done. 
Butch Coolidge, played by Bruce Willis, picks up three items in the pawn shop before he picks a katana sword to save <laughs> wow, that's hard. from the rapist. <laughs> okay, so um, what are the three items he picked before the sword? Let me guess: baseball bat. Yeah. Yes. A chainsaw. Yes. <laughs> a golf club. I don't know. Hammer. When we're first introduced to Marcellus Wallace, he's facing away from us, speaking to Butch about throwing the fight. What Al Green song is playing during that exchange? Oh, fuck. What Al Green song? Um, I don't know. Let's stay together. Okay. Now we got the game. <laughs> you have to remember. That wasn't the game? <laughs> no. That's the game, right? Let's see if Bobby could save Andres' life with an adrenaline <laughs> shot. Okay, yeah. So I do not trust you much, but if I was... If I had a drug overdose. <laughs> uh, please grab everything, Andres. We're kind of a bare bones crew. <laughs> All right. So let's see. Uh, you have to save my life. Okay. You have to. Oh. Can I have the needle? Yes. I will count to three. And you have to plunge it. You have to aim directly and plunge it deep enough that it goes into his heart. One, two, three. Holy shit. I have zero confidence in you. Uh, speak into the mic, Andres. I have zero confidence in you. Why? You saved my life. No, oh, good aim. Yeah, I have eyes <laughs> and motor skills. What the fuck are you talking about? Right. Can you do that? I can't. You can't? No. Yeah, yeah. Not. I would have died. <laughs> yes, you yeah, would have yeah. died. How good was that? that was Let's see Andres really do it. Do the other side. <laughs> yeah. Let's see Andreas do it. Yeah. One, two, two three. three. Okay. <laughs> Death. <laughs> Death, dude. Look at that. And look I at how tried. fucking precise I was. <laughs> you did bullseye. Bullseye, dude. Here. Good job. Well. In the movie, Mia Wallace says... Why? No, it's, we're done with <laughs> that. You found somebody <laughs> really special when you can just shut the fuck up for a minute and comfortably share silence. Bobby and Andres will now share 30 seconds of silence oh. while staring into each other's eyes. That's got to be 30 seconds. <laughs> yes. It has to be. That was 25 seconds. Oh. How did that feel? I felt nothing. <laughs> yeah, nothing. I felt nothing. <laughs> so this is what some people have said about the movie. And you have to defend the movie. Goalie. Everyone is falling all over themselves about this one. It's silly, violent, nihilistic, pointless. All the talent. Pass. Mm. I mean, that's the point, right? I mean, to me, it's like um, life isn't perfect. It's messy. Life is dark. It, life is um, extremely dynamic and intricate and um, chaos at times. So I disagree. Okay. You know, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll give you another, I'm gonna, another thing I want to say about that is, is that... Um, you know, a lot of times when you're listening to a song, right, that doesn't have a lot of lyrics, right, and you don't really know what it's about, but you can just get a sense, you know what I mean? It's, a, it's an overwhelming feeling, right, that you, it might take you back and give you a nostalgic kind of a vibe, but there's something about, you know what I mean, the, the way the instruments are used. You see that also in certain independent movies where it's like, you know, the so story's pretty much simple there's no real plot but the the fucking movie has an ambiance and a tone that you can't shake so i think pulp fiction is a mood almost you know all right uh 
This one is the most disgusting movie of all time. Pulp Fiction panders to base behavior. The filth of the language subject matter, including sodomy, <laughs> etc. <laughs> uh, this movie is one of the worst pieces of trash ever pawned off as art. Mm, I disagree. I mean, you know... Um... It's funny, I, you know, sometimes when I'm on the road and I'm at like a restaurant by myself, like I was just in Tulsa, and you know, you're at a restaurant and you overhear conversations with other people. That's a, the only thing I like to do it. Mm -hmm. And there was these two old ladies sharing um, fabric details about a pillow that they were making. No, you gotta, you know, you, you gotta take this yarn, right? And you gotta tie it like this. And you got to go to Maple's, you know what I mean, fabric store. They have the best pattern, you know what I mean? And they, they go on and on about it, right? And I want to go, what the fuck are you talking about? Right? Mm -hmm. It's crazy, right? But this is what normal people talk about, right? I just don't have, you know I mean, that background and that sensibility and that temperament to talk about that, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, as soon as you brought up fabrics, I go, I'm going to jam this fucking toothpick in your eyeball, dude. Shut the fuck up, you know what I mean? Right. Right, so it just people have different sensibilities. So I could see if you're, you grew up a Mormon, right? And you only watched, you know what I mean, um, Mary Poppins <laughs> or whatever, right? right? And then all of a sudden, you know what I mean, you're forced to watch Pulp Fiction, that it would be offensive to you and visceral in a bad way you know what i mean i can understand that but it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad movie it's you know what i mean right it's a movie that um also here's another thing i want to say is is if you don't watch a lot of movies right and then you see a movie and you're like i don't like that right you have to kind of like it's like star wars for instance right I've, you know, I've dated girls in their early 30s, late 20s, right? Mm -hmm. you know, and when me and Kalila broke up. I'm single now, by the way. I'm not seeing anybody. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay uh, single for a year. But my point is, is this. Um, and they go, well, you know, the graphics aren't that great on Star Wars. I know, but you got you to gotta go, when was it made? Put yourself, right? Like The Exorcist. When that shit came out, people fainted, Right while they were watching the movie. People walked out of the movie and vomited, right? A movie like The Exorcist now, because we're so jaded, right? It's not going to do that, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, sometimes with music and with art, you have to put yourself in the era when it comes out, right? What was going on in, you know, like The Velvet Underground, for instance, in the fucking 60s, people were talking about, the, you know, The Grateful Dead, about peace and love and flower power, right? And hippie shit, Right? And the Velvet Runner was like, no, we're going to talk about the street, about, you know what I mean, S drugs in, in a negative way, you know what I mean? And these dark, you know what I mean, environments that New York had during that time, right? And it's like, you know, that's it. Yeah. I don't know what I'm saying. No, it's a good defense. Go ahead. Okay. One of the worst movies ever made. If I could give this film a negative 10, it would, <laughs> it would not begin to describe how horrible it is. There is little to not plot, the story never resolves, and it jumps around in time and sequences so much that it's impossible to make any sense of it. It's not, no. It, it, it's all those moments, like even in Reservoir Dogs, you know, it jumps around a lot, right? I, I felt like they were all perfectly placed in terms of like, you know. Yeah, the puzzle fits. It fits to me, yeah. you know? And um, yeah, I just love when I watch a movie and it's like, um, I, I, I understand this world. You know, um, I'm not proud of myself that I understand it, but, um, you know, you've been like, you and I have both been, you know, we're city guys, right. And we've walked by like late night you know, downtown or whatever. And you walk by businesses that you go, there's no way that's a glass factory. There's some <laughs> shady shit going on here. Right. 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 They're just these elements that are going on. You know I mean that we're not seeing right a dark undertone and um it's the same with pulp fiction when you know when bruce walks into that you would never know that downstairs there was a gimp <laughs> right right and some fucking harsh crazy shit going on right. right you know when it comes to um tarantino's use of the n-word for instance right yeah i mean 
you know, unfortunately in our society, you know what I mean, there are people that use that word that aren't black, right? And it's terrible, right? But, you know, he's, you know, when you're watching it as a kid, it is offensive when you hear it, but you also believe that these characters would say it. Yeah. Right? Um, also, his reality is like he grew up with a black yeah. stepfather and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was exposed to that. That's yeah. how the people he was around with. Also, if he didn't have black people in his movies, right. right, that'd be an issue, right? Yeah. But it launched Samuel L. Jack L. Jackson's career, right? There would be no Samuel L. Jackson without fucking Pulp Fiction. Yeah, without Tarantino. He yeah. Be a second rated actor. Yeah. And I loved how, um, I don't know, I just, it's a classic. It really is what, like, it's, you know, one of the best. Yeah. I mean, I could just rattle off my top 10 right now, dog. What are your top 10? My top 10 is this in no particular order. Okay. I'm going to try. Okay. Being there. I know. I tried to do that one. L now, now, you're asking me, like, oh, you like crazy movies? Being there isn't the opposite right. of the movies you would think that I would like, mm -hmm. you know? Number right. two, um, Paris, Texas. Not that violent of a movie. Yeah. Um, it does, you know, um, it's just it, the feeling of love loss. You know, like, you know, when I was in my early 20s, I was in these, like, a lot of unrequited love kind of situations where my heart was broken and this and that. And I could really relate to Harry Dean Stanton's character, like, wandering through a desert for five years because of love loss, mm -hmm. right? Not being able to even drink or really eat much, you know what I mean? Um, I would have to go um, Yohimbo. Okay. Yohimbo is funny. Some of those characters, there's a got one of the characters in the movie. You know, his, he, you know, he comes in the, and it has that music, and it's just the characters are in it. I think um, there are just so many levity, funny moments in that movie. Um, it's just so good. That movie's so fucking good. So good. Do you think? Yeah. Yeah. I honestly think Taxi Driver. A dark movie. Dark movie. Dark movie. Um. Let's go Royal Tenenbaums. Okay. No? Yeah? Yeah. It really affected me, Royal Tenenbaums. Hereditary is another one I would put in my top 10. For a horror movie, it hit, it just, it hit all my nerves. Um, how many have I done so far? Seven. Um, you Can Count on Me is another one. I love that movie. Small movie. The first movie, Mark Ruffalo, you've ever really seen him in. Mm -hmm. When he did that movie, um, all the papers like, this is the next Brandau. It really was his breakout movie. It's simple story. Yeah. I love that fucking movie. Let's go. Um, I Truman Show. I love Truman Show. Good. That's another tone movie for me. Yeah. Oh, I, we have to go here. Raising Arizona. I could rattle off a bunch of Coen Brothers movies, but the zaniness. Uh, your favorite? The zaniness in that movie, you know, the camera work, the humor. I was so related to Nicolas um, Cage's character in it. Yeah. In terms of his style, Hawaiian shirt, you know what I mean? Um, there's this one thing that always makes me laugh where, you know, I mean, he's trying to immediately, he has to clean up the bedroom, but he has to take a last peek at that porn magazine before he puts it underneath the right. fucking bed, right? Mm -hmm. Funny. The whole movie's great. How many is that? One more. Do one more? Yeah. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Let's go Serg Sergio Leone. Okay. That's it. Okay. It's a good list. Because can I just say something about that movie? You yeah. can watch a million spaghetti westerns, right? But there's you can just tell that there are so many artistic choices in that. That first scene where you just see the shots of the eyes, right? And just also how the opening credits come about, you know, with the fucking, you know, cartoony, you know what I mean? It's just so good, right? So and what's fun. his name? Um not Clint Eastwood. I, I, I have it in, 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 in my I, head too. I have it in my Eli head. Eli Wallach. Eli Wallach. Yeah. Right? Bro. Masterclass. Yeah. Great character. Right? Really good actor. Yeah. So that's it. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Awesome talking to you. Yay. <laughs>